Here's an idea. Space travel might make you a better person. In 1969, we did what was both literally and figuratively one of the most math things we, meaning people, have ever done. We landed on the moon. No way. We went there six times and put a total of 12 men on it. Over the course of three and a half years, the US blasted off to a distant rock for many very complex reasons. To examine the moon's surface and geology, you know, to make sure it's not made of cheese. As a matter of cultural and scientific pride as a growing world power in the mid 20th century. To leave some poop there and of course to stick it to the Russians. And then we just kind of stopped. I mean, not going to space, we did just send a robot to Mars. But with the Cold War over, other wars coming and going, a massively shifting cultural landscape and a growing private sector in the sciences, government support for space exploration has recently been at an all time low. There is, however, a molybdenum lining. Sort of. Remember that growing private sector in the sciences? Well, it includes space travel. Some not quite but almost Tony Stark style geniuses decided that instead of designing a new toothbrush or starting Facebook for dogs, they would rather go to space. And no one argued with them. SpaceX is the first commercial business to launch orbit and land a spacecraft, dock with the space station, and will probably be the first to launch a geostationary satellite. It occurs to me now that these guys better be Iron Man style geniuses and not Mandarin style evil geniuses. Otherwise we're in trouble. The straight talk is that SpaceX, the company started by the guy with his eye in the sky, spends $100 million a year to NASA's 16 billion spent last year alone. So they're pretty far off from being anything more than insane toys for the rich. But it makes you wonder, cars, trains, air travel, watches, televisions, mobile phones, they were all at one point toys for the rich. Sure, nothing so seemingly extravagant as space travel. Just a tiny box in your pocket that has more computing power than all of NASA in 1969. The idea being that once we start adding private economies into the mix, we can expect at some point, a point which might be very far off but existent nonetheless, that normal people will be able to go to space. And I think that this is very important. Here's why. When an astronaut blasts into the distant blue, does a U-turn and looks at their home rock, they are presented, nay, bludgeoned, with perspective. Alan Shepard, the first American in space, said that if somebody'd said before the flight, are you gonna get carried away just staring at the Earth from the moon? I'd have said no, no way. But yet, when I first looked back at the Earth, standing on the moon, I cried. And Rusty Schweikert, the lunar module pilot for Apollo 9, said that when you go around the Earth in an hour and a half, you begin to recognize that your identity is with that whole thing. That makes a change. It comes through to you so powerfully that you're the sensing element for man. Whoa. And it's not just these dudes. This sense befalls many space travelers. And in reading their accounts, it's clear that words just barely do it justice. I should have said the poet. Overview effect is the term used to describe the change in behavior experienced by people who have had a romp in the stars. It's characterized by feelings of bliss, profound awareness, and universal interconnectedness, which just sounds awesome, literally. So, but why? Why does overview effect happen? I have a guess. Our view of the world, much like parts of the space program, is political. We view the world through history, relationships, threats, treaties. When we picture it, we imagine borders, countries, and states. Hi, I'm in Delaware. And even if you don't, these things are often expressed by infrastructure, signage, culture, everything. This is just how the world. It's the empire's map all over again. In his book, The Power of Maps, Dennis Wood writes, the map doesn't let us see anything, but it does let us know what others have seen or found out or discovered. The things they learned piled up in layer atop layer so that to study even the simplest looking image is to peer back through ages of cultural acquisition. This is the world to us, ages of cultural acquisition. And what do you see when you look at the earth from space or from the moon? A unified whole. Blue, some green, white, and round. That's it. Just an object mostly harmless. But yeah, space travel is hard. You have to be fit, it's cramped, it can mess up your bones and make you an insomniac. And maybe the people who experience overview effect are in some way the only people who ever would. I mean, astronauts look forward to this moment for their whole lives. So yes, it might be a little pie in the sky to think that while space travel started out political, it could in some way cure us of politics. I think a little perspective never hurt anyone. What do you guys think? Would widespread space travel provide some much needed perspective? Let us know in the comments. And if you wanna feel universal interconnectedness with the rest of the Idea Channel subscribers, you know what to do. I don't know about you guys, but I'm glad that I didn't have to pile into the back of John Cusack's limo to escape the end of the world. Let's see what you guys had to say about the apocalypse. To Alexander Salomon and everyone else who pointed out that we used a Aztec calendar instead of a Mayan one, yeah, we messed that one up, sorry. But to compare us to the History Channel, 
that stings. And thanks to a lot of llamas for pointing out that we didn't get the plural for Maya right. I knew this going into the episode, but I just, I messed it up, but thank you, thanks. To see Philly 27, it's actually really straightforward. You just have to like the taste of dirt, root beer, and backwash which I do. Nicholas Medusa thinks that we're obsessed with the end of the world because it's entertaining, uh, for the same reason that we like ghost stories and scary stories and stuff like that, uh, which, yeah, you're, there is an entertaining element. It's a little morbid, but entertaining nonetheless. Tiveris says that it's really easy to blame the teleological perspective on Western culture uh, and religion, but that it's actually probably a little bit more complicated than that, um, and points out that uh, in the West, we sort of have this idea that if you aren't moving forward, you're moving backwards, uh, which is really interesting. Caleb Valdez points out that not all Western religions are are focused on or hoping for the end of the world, which is, I think, a good thing. Jay Bantha points out that the apocalypse is exciting because it's a new thing in a time where new things are kind of hard to come by. To Blur866, I don't know if your logic holds up, but I am totally on board with your final point. To Run52, I spell it like the beginning of psychology, but to really find out, we'd have to call all the way back to 1995, which would be difficult. And now we're gonna choose a few of our favorite New Year's resolutions, uh, but I just wanna say to everyone who posted their screen resolutions, you are all very clever. Rational Pie says that his New Year's strategy is to have new month resolutions, um, which I really like and sounds like a great idea. I don't know if I could eat vegetarian for a whole month though. Was that one really hard? I bet it was. Warrior Z676 resolves to learn Blender, which I have always wanted to do, but just never had the time. It looks really fun. Let me know how you do. Bennington! Uh, Lang and I are friends, so. To Lorna Drucker, flasking orchids looks really cool. Keep us updated and post some pictures. 